Good afternoon, everyone. It's almost lunch time. I know it's heartbreaking to sit here. That will listen to a talk about a heartbreak. Uh, my topic is on uh, management of cardiac shock, including the role of mechanical circulatory support. So I'll start with a scenario for better understanding. I think this we come across here regularly. A 35-year-old year man uh, had a sudden chest pain at workplace. Finally, he was moved to an hospital. Uh, when they moved to in that hospital, they noticed that there's no catheter, there's no advanced cardiac support in that hospital. I think this uh, scenario we come across regularly in our routine practice. They go to smaller centers. By the time we, rec we receive these patients, it will be too late. So uh, per se, this, most of the patients will die of cardiogenic shock, secondary to ACS per se. So basically, we are discussing about cardiogenic shock today. In cardiogenic shock, we'll discuss what is cardiogenic shock, when we should treat it, where we should treat it, how to treat it, uh, what are the role of gadgets. There are a lot of gadgets involved in the management of cardiogenic shock, and why cardiogenic shock treatment is very important. Why it is, is it's basically a nothing but a low cardiac output state with a life-threatening organ hypoperfusion and hypoxia. Why it is, is it's almost has got a 50% mortality if you don't treat it properly. Even if you treat it, it has got a very high mortality. So in most of the cases, 80% of the cases, it is the ACS, as we already know. But a subset of patients might be there where it can be myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, or it can be post-cardiotomy also. There are certain causes for cardiogenic shock. So understanding of cardiogenic shock as evolved also, how we define also as evolved. Uh, there, if you go to a lot of textbooks, they give a lot of different definitions per se. Clinically, it is nothing but uh, it is characterized by low cardiac output with clinical and biochemical evidence of hypoperfusion. Uh, in the 1999, when the shock trial was published, they used a clinical criteria of less than 90. As you can see here, hemodynamic criteria, they used a cardiac index of less than 2.2 and PCWP of more than 15. That means that they used pulmonary artery catheter. How many of us use pulmonary artery catheter in routine practice nowadays? We don't. Uh, practice has evolved over a course of time. So in the recent 22 French shock trial, as you can see, the definition has changed. Instead of uh, using, uh, we are not, no longer using PCWP, we are using more of a cardiac index by, by less than two by using transthoracic echocardiography along with other parameters. So there's an evolution of definition based on what exactly we are using nowadays. Okay, uh, understanding of pathophysiology is very important before you treat it. As you know, in, car in cardiogenic shock, the most, most problem is the contractility. Is contractility alone is a problem? No. The understanding of cardiogenic shock is more complex than we think. It's not only low cardiac output, there's a complex interplay of a lot of mechanisms will happen. There is a offload, it can be increased or decreased. There is a change in the preload also, it can be low. So it's a complex interplay of three mechanisms. It's a contractility, preload and offload. Invariably, what are the mechanism is there? They will develop low cardiac output, they will develop hypertension, they will, at the end of that, uh, after that, they will have an inflammatory response similar to our sepsis and ARDS. Not only cardiac parameter, there is a play of inflammatory mediators in cardiogenic shock. If somebody asks me, which is a marker of high mortality, whether uh, uh, something like a pro-BNP D-dimer or interleukins, interleukins are the one, they are also with a high mortality. There is a complex interplay of a lot of inflammatory mediators. So there is an increase in inflammatory mediators. Our goal is to stop patient going into this phase per se. If they go into this phase, it's a downhill from there onwards. So understanding of cardiogenic shock has evolved over a course of time. Uh, it can be classified into different phenotypes, depending on the mechanism per se, or depending on pathogenesis, they can be classified into different types. I'm talking about one of the classification is phenotypes, because depending on which phenotype they are, there is an increase in the mortality. First is where it is a non-congested, there is no congestion of the lungs per se. Second is cardiorenal, there is an involvement of kidney in this. Third is cardiometabolic. The reason it is important is cardiometabolic, if you go into cardiometabolic where there is an increase in inflammatory mediator, there is a multi-organ failure, we have got a high mortality. Sometimes we can say that it's just an evolution of the disease per se. It can progress from stage one to uh, from uh, one phenotype to other phenotype, depending on the treatment. Uh, there are a lot of uh, classification per se. There one more is Intermax. But nowadays, most of the people we uh, st uh, try discussing over sky classification, sky stages of cardiogenic shock. Uh, I will talk about uh, these stages also during further discussion. It can be classified into A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, a is somebody who has uh, just a uh, heart attack. We know that, but they're stable enough. They might 
uh, B is somebody who has just have a lactate slightly high or BP is just borderline. C is somebody who have a cardiogenic shock already. They might require some support in the form of phenotrops. D is somebody is uh, with further version. They require some kind of advanced cardiogenic shock. Without treatment, they'll progress to E. E is somebody is on the way to death. Okay. This is the classification. Stage C is something we have to intervene and make sure that nothing happens. Stage D will be in advanced cardiac support. Stage D E is the more, more of a moribund. This is one more classification. I'll not, I'll not go into detail per se. So way to treat this cardiogenic shock. Every hospital claims that they can treat better, but there have been a lot of studies which have been done. Uh, basically, meta-analysis, which involved the PCI and CBG studies, more than a million patients were treated in this. They said that you should treat in the centers where they do more than 600 cases a year. Better to treat these patients here. They got a mortality benefit. So, but all this, uh, all the patients can go to these kind of centers. It is difficult. Not all patients can be shifted. So, ACCHA recommends that there's a, they have come with a protocol where basically it's a hub and spoke model, where they say that there have been there are about two kinds of hospitals. One is hub is a main center where they can do all kinds of support, whereas uh, spokes are multiple centers we can do a PCI. If any patient has a heart attack uh, without shock, all of them will be moved to PCI. If they have a shock, they'll be directly moved to a hub hospital. Or patients in PCI hospital develop a cardiogenic shock, they'll be moved to a hub center. So this is known as hub and spoke model. So this patient finally, with all the awareness and all, they decide to shift in hub hospital. A uh, patient has an anti wall STEMI, noted to be in a cardiogenic shock. There were his vitals for heart rate of 130, uh, respiratory rate of 26, saturation of 85, BP of 80 by 40. What next? Anybody? Any role of fluids in cardiogenic shock? Anybody's? Huh? Yes, good, very good. Inferior volume is there. Definitely, there's a role of fluids. In cardiogenic shock, as I told you, it's not only decreased cardiac output, it's a complex interplay of in, uh, multiple things will be there. There'll be decreased preload, there can be decreased offload. So each patient you have to assess. There might be a role of fluids. Depending on the patient condition, you have to give fluids. Okay. Uh, then uh, next thing is, if they're not responding to the fluids per se, go with the vasopressors. Uh, there have been uh, multiple discussions, but recently things have been clarified. What is the drug of choice in cardiogenic shock per se? Most of the society, ESC, ACC, AHA, uh, most of the societies say that now, first line of uh, first line of choice is norepinephrine. So there have been a lot of trials have come up. Sorry for this 2010. One is SOAP2 study, which is published in 2010, where they compared with norepinephrine dopamine in patients with cardiogenic shock. Now dopamine had got increased mortality, so we prefer norepinephrine nowadays. Uh, Mildenone and Obden, more of inodilator. Uh, they found that the between them, there's not much difference is there at this point of time. But patient is on chronic beta blockers, mildrinone is preferred because dopamine doesn't act that well. Epinephrine versus norepinephrine. Epinephrine, they found that they know there's not much mortality difference is there. There is increased incidence of refractory shock with epinephrine. Between levosimindan and dopamine, at this point of time, not, not much difference is there. So recently, AHS has come up with a uh, proposed strategy, how to manage, but each patient is different. You have to assess your patient per se, how they are. Uh, initial to uh, told, I told you, drug of choice is norepinephrine. You patient is having a persistent shock, reassess the patient. If patient has a low cardiac output, you can add mildrinone or dobutamine. If persistent hypertension is there, you assess. If there is a vasoplegia, you consider vasopressin. Still the refractory hypertension is there, you can consider trial of methane blue. So, when to treat it is very important. So we know that reperfusion is useful. How fast we should consider reperfusion? Uh, this is a short trial which is published in 2006. Basically where they did the re re reperfusion within 12 hours compared to the medical stabilization. Early reperfusion has got a mortality benefit, 46.5% versus 50%. So consider early reperfusion. It has got a mortality benefit even when they look at six and four months also. So other question which more, most commonly people ask is, they have done a CAG, there is a triple vessel disease. Okay, but LED is 100% blocked. We know that there are EC changes are there. Whether to treat LED or you want to treat all the three lesions. If they're doing CBG, they'll treat invariably. If they're doing only PCA, which is important. Yeah, whether you do other two lesions or not, <coughs> you're not supposed to do it. So that is my famous uh, trial, culprit shock trial, where they found that they, if you do only culprit lesions, uh, PCA, there was a mortality benefit compared to all three, all the lesions. 
Uh, they found that if you, if you keep doing the other two PCIs also, they've spent a lot of time in the cath lab. There's a refractive shock will proceed because if we don't do medical stabilization. A lot of contrast will be given in causing more harm per se, more incidence of uh, C RRT in these kind of patients. So treat only culprit lesion, don't go on treating all the lesions. So next is positive pressure ventilation. I think already Dr. Sanjay told, it caused more harm in case of right heart failure, but in case of left heart failure, it's a lot beneficial. Uh, it mainly, as I told you, we discussed with three factors per se, everything preload, contractility, and afterload. So normally, uh, pressures here, in case of spontaneous breathing, it will be negative, okay? So what happens in case of positive pressure ventilation is, uh, so positive airway pressure will be there. In turn, it will be reflected into positive alveolar pressure. In turn, it will cause positive uh, pleural pressure. What happens is this positive pleural pressure will have an effect on the heart per se. It will increase the transmural pressure, improving the contractility per se a little bit. This positive pressure also causes IVC compression. This IVC compression will cause decrease in the preload per se, or decrease the pulmonary circulation, decrease the preload per se. And one more thing it will do is, Initially, there is a stimulation of baroreceptors in the iota, which will cause aortic dilatation. So overall, it decreases the preload, it increases the transmural pressure, inc improving the output per se, it decreases the afterload. So positive pressure ventilation has got a lot of benefit per se in case of cardiogenic shock or in case of pulmonary edema also. So the role of gadgets, there have been a lot of gadgets. First thing we'll talk about PAC. I think uh, after the escape trial in 2005, there are a lot of discourage in using the PAC per se, but you should understand that in the uh, escape trial, they did it on only on the stable patient. They excluded the cardiogenic shock patients, okay? So after that, a lot of people thought it's of no use, but people kept using it, especially those who uh, do a large amount of uh, cardiac cases. So uh, see how pulmonary cancer analysis, it, it helps in understanding the physiology and pathophysiology of cardiogenic shock. You don't say that understanding a pathophysiology is of no significance. It will be of helpful, but you should know how to use it also. It gives a lot of value. It gives cardiac output, cardiac index. It gives pulmonary catheter pressure. It gives CVP. It gives a shunt fraction. All these values have got importance in the clinical management, each one of them. So recently, there is a change in under paradigm of uh, using. Even though there was no evidence, a lot of societies keep uh, recommending, please use it. Don't, don't get discouraged just because one trial showed that it's of not benefit. Don't get discouraged. Okay. So one of the recently, uh, one, one, uh, one trial was published recently, basically it's a registry. They went through the registry to look at whenever they used pulmonary catheter, how it's doing. So there are, they are uh, classified into three types, three types, depending on the utilization of pulmonary artery catheter. One is 42% patients have all the values, they got all the values with the pulmonary artery catheter. 18%, they didn't, even though they had inserted, they didn't uh, determine any values. 40% patient, there is an incomplete values. There are values, but it are incomplete. When they, low, when they noted what happened to these kind of patients, as I told you, sky classification stage D and uh, overall patients, patients who have used with all the values, this black patient have got a mortality benefit if they use it properly, okay? It depends how to use it. If you don't know you how to use it, don't use it. If you know how to use it, use it and utilize it completely. So there is a benefit compared to other two grasta groups. Definitely there is much more mortality benefit out there. If you know how to use a pulmonary catheter, please use it. Next is echocardiography. Echocardiography is very important to understand a lot of parameters, LV function, RV function, uh, 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 any mechanical complication, all those things can determine. There are the study which is done. Uh, recently, there is much, much more understanding of echocardiography. People are moving from transthoracic to transesophageal. When they did a TE, they found that there's a patient in condition was much better. There's no mortality benefit per se, but patient helped. Uh, there's an improvement in the organ failure status per se. So there was a beneficial if you use echocardiography, it is easy to use it, it especially transthoracic. It is non-invasive, safe, portable, and relatively inexpensive. PICO, I think more, most of centers, they, they don't want pulmonary catheter, but they have to have somewhere in between. A lot of people are moving towards the semi-invasive uh, parameters. That is PICO. Even though there is no mortality benefit with the use of PICO per se, there is there an improvement in the Apache and SOFA score. There is a decrease in the length of stay. Cardiac, cardiac indices are much better if you use a PICO. So these patients, finally, you did all the thing. You should uh, did a reperfusion and all, but uh, you use vasopressors. Patient continue to have a refractory shock with increasing dose of vasopressors. Patient is intubated and is on ventilator. What is the next step? Hmm? Anybody? Yes, mechanical circulatory support, which is the most common one we use. Yes. Okay. 
IABP is the one which is most commonly used. Uh, there have been a lot of trials published in IABP per se. They found that there's not much mortality benefit. That there's no not much benefit per se, but it has been continued to use because of the simplicity of use, ease of use, and it can be put in a cath lab very easily. So people continue to use it, but evidence is not mu that much strong. So the next is mechanical circulatory support devices. There are a lot of uh, mechanical circulatory devices are there in the market. Uh, each one of them, uh, they vary in the different function and the management per se. In case of VA ECMO, they remove the blood from the IVC. It is passed through a pump. There is the oxygenator where it is get oxygenated and it is pushed back into the IOTA. Okay, it is a simple one. VA ECMO is used more commonly. Uh, Impella uh, is also a mechanical circulatory device support where what they do is they put a uh, catheter into the LV. Okay, it will go across the IOTA. Basically, it will pump the blood from LV to the IOTA. So it is more physiological compared to that. And uh, it is also, uh, after VA ECMO, Impella is which something which is more commonly used. LVAD is where something blood is taken out from the LV, it is pushed through a pump, and it is given to the IOTA, but it is outside the heart per se. So y there are, uh, whenever you consider all these things, timing is very important. VA ECMO is something which has been used and it is found to have a lot of beneficial. Uh, there is a benefit in case of VA ECMO, but early initiation is of much more benefit. As you found here, find here, there's a, if the patient are initiated uh, early on ECMO support, there is much more beneficial. The more delay, the more is the mortality of without initiation. So as I told, timing is important. There's, uh, there's a study published in Jack in 2021 where they uh, consider the time, early initiation, intermediate initiation, and late initiation. Early initiation is as early as 0.9 hours. Intermediate is 2.2, late is 24 hours. Here, they found that early initiation has got a less mortality, whereas late initiation has got a higher mortality. So if you decide to initiate, initiate early. So it's very, it's a, based on timing. But how will you decide which patient needs an early ECMO or not? So they need a quantification always, uh, subjective. Uh, subject, objective thing should be there rather than being a subjective. There have been a lot of studies which are uh, done. One is uh, an early initiation of ECMO, uh, which is an ECLS study, which is published in NEGM in 2023. One is late initiation of ECMO. Not exactly I can say late, but depending on the parameters which are used, I can say it slightly later. Uh, it is published in 2022, where an indication of ECMO was in this, you see, any patient with an hypertension more than 30 minutes or lactate is more than three. I think... Uh, it's quite early, uh, none of us do it so fast, but they have done it in this. And in this, they used, as I told, sky stage of classification, stage D they have used in this. Okay. So they found that, so early initiation doesn't have any benefit. If you early, maybe you are exposing patients to more co more problems per se. Uh, in this, they, you, where they initiated late also, they found that not much significant differences there. So there have been a lot of studies which are going on on this per se. Uh, one more is, uh, one more uh, subjective kind of thing you can use is uh, VAS score, vasopressor infusion score per se. Basically what it is is, they use all the vasopressors or inotropes which are being used, they'll add into a scoring system, and then look at the score per se. Uh, when they found that, uh, when a patient, uh, it is also they've gone through a registry, it's not a prospective trial per se, they've gone through a registry. If you initiate ECMO when VAS score is less than 32, there has got a significant mortality benefit. If VS score is more than 32, the mortality is very high, okay? Uh, one of my friend has uh, developed a uh, software. Basically, you can calculate a VS score by using, the, you can go to this, if you scan it, it'll go to that link. You can calculate VS score by using this. Or what you can do is, uh, it, uh, it also has a lot of other features, like uh, if you are giving a noradrenaline MG, we know that it's an MG, we know patient weight, but calculation every time is very difficult. So there's a software per se where if you automatically enter the patient weight values and all and how much norad is going on, it will use the in mics per kg per minute. So it's easier to calculate per se. So per se, we, as I told you, there are different level of supports are there. One is IBP is very less support, maybe 10, 20 percent, not more than that, zero to one liter. It may not be, it is not that much beneficial as I showed you. Impella, there are a lot of trials have come with Impella per se, Impella and Tandamart. At this point of time, survival benefit is not that much. Whereas at this point of time, ECMO is something which can be considered, especially where you should consider is very important. Class C might be too early, class D might be too late. You should consider somewhere in between. Uh, some trials, uh, as you know, that early initiation is beneficial, and it has found some evidence per se. So my take-home message on this talk will be, 
always better to manage in a tertiary care centers with all the backup early invasive strategy less than 12 hours culprit vessel pca only psc still has a role in complicated and cardiogenic shock uh, regular screening with echo if needed te also can be used not only really the first choice of vasopressor not much evidence for iobp ecmo initiation at appropriate time MCS devices have a role but need more evidence at this point of time. Thank you.